Stephen wants me to begin by reading scripture, so I am going to read the scripture. So let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 14, verse 1. Luke chapter 14, verse 1. Okay, and it happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. I guess that's how you say that. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent, and he took hold of them and healed them and sent them away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they can make no reply to this. Now, let's go down to verse 22. Let's see. Yeah, we got music playing, so if you want to kindly. Stephen, are you sure 22 is the right verse? Uh, I think verse 16. And a man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, you, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you that none of those men who, ta who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Thanks, Brian. Brian's a lot better reader than I am, so I figured it would be better if he read. Um, well, Cole, I, I want to pray for us. And when we were in worship, I, this poem came to my mind. And uh, I just want to pray that and then pray for us, and then we can get started. Uh, it's a poem by Amy Carmichael, who was a missionary to India. But uh, let's bow our heads and just pray. It says, From prayer that asks that I may be sheltered from winds that beat on thee, from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher, from silken self, O captain free, thy soldier who would follow thee, from, su from subtle love of softening things, from easy choices, weakenings, not thus our spirits fortified, not this way went the crucified. From all the dims that thy Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. Give me love that we leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no, disappointment, no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like a fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel, flame of God. And so, Lord, I just pray today, Lord, that, Lord, as I speak, and Lord, as people listen, Father, one, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would speak through me, that you would take my words away, and that you would bring things to my mind that I need to say. Lord, listen to, through everyone, Lord. Lord, we have so much truth, we have so much doctrine, we have so much ideas, but Lord, what we need is a reality, Lord, of the things that, that we're learning. What we need is revelation. And so, Lord, I pray that the things that I speak today will become a reality, Lord, in our hearts, Lord. And, and Lord, would you make us, the, make us fuel to your flame, Lord? Lord, what you're calling us to is impossible apart from a work of grace. So, Lord, would you baptize our hearts today with fire? Would you baptize us today with hearts of, of your spirit? Would you baptize us in your love? And, Lord, speak through us. Lord, I can do nothing apart from you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm nothing apart from you, Lord. Absolutely nothing, Lord. So speak through me, Holy Spirit. Listen through everyone else, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Awesome. So hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving uh, holiday. Um, so we uh, were eating Thanksgiving uh, lunch at Brian's house, and I was the first one to sit down along with Angie's niece, Bethany, and she had just gone to California, and so I was asking her about her trip and just kind of asking her a few questions. And then Brian sits down, and he asks her the same questions because I was talking about California. So Brian sits down, and he asks her, he asks her literally the same questions. And then my dad comes in and sits at the table, and he hears, hears that we're talking about California and Bethany's trip. So my dad uh, asks the same questions. And then my mom comes and sits down and asks the same exact questions as I was asking. And that's not exaggerating. That really happened. And if you don't, if you don't know my family, that's a Kessler thing. We ask a lot of questions, and we usually ask the same questions over and over again. And uh, sometimes like, I'll be talking to my dad in the room as well, and my mom will be on her Fitbit walking around. Uh, the, the, the house, and then the, the kind of the kitchen separates the den, so my mom will be listening, and then she'll ask a question in the kitchen while we're in the den, and we have no idea what she's saying. So it's just a, it's just a Kessler thing. And so the title of the message, kind of to lead into that, is it's called The Critical Question, because I love questions. This title is called The Critical Question, and basically what I'm going to do, Brian read the parable uh, of the great banquet, and so we're going to be going through that. But through that, I'm going to ask you four questions, four critical questions that I believe are key to your life, that I believe are key to this church and how you answer them. Um, Just like the song was singing in worship today, when you stand before Jesus, you're going to wish that you gave more. And that's because everyone's going to wish they've given more when they see him, obviously. But these are four critical questions that I believe that, that you need to answer, that I need to answer, that corporately as a church we need to answer. And how we answer them will really determine our, our destiny and kind of what the Lord's doing. Um, and I, oh yeah, I gave you a note card as well. So I'm not a big guy. I, I never took notes in high school or college. So I gave you a note card. And so basically, I want you, with a note card, I just want you to write down these four questions. And the challenge, if you don't have note cards, there's come back there. But uh, the challenge is to write down these four questions, pray through them. And, and just be honest with yourself, be honest with the Lord, and, and, and just answer these questions, and, and the Lord will reveal, reveal to you. Um, so cool. So we're talking today about the parable of the great banquet. And I love that Jesus invites us to a party, you know, not into a cemetery. He, his king, he, he compares his kingdom to a banquet, to a party. His first miracle was at a wedding where he turned water into wine. And so Jesus, he loves to have a good time, and he invites us to a party. And uh, kind of the context of this parable, Jesus, kind of a, a, a Jewish man, rabbi type of guy, like very like lower middle class probably, uh, he was at, he was at uh, the Pharisee's house. And the Pharisees, if you don't know what a Pharisee, I think everyone here does, but the Pharisees were religious and political leaders uh, in Israel at the time of Jesus. And they were, most of them were uh, elite part of the Jewish class. And so Jesus was there talking to them, eating dinner with them, and what happened, it was on the Sabbath day, so basically the Sabbath was the holy day where they rested and and literally did nothing, and this one Jewish guy, or the one Pharisee asked him, hey, if you had, if you had, would you, or would you heal on the Sabbath, and so Jesus tells him, and then uh, he tells, like, you know, if you have, uh, if you have an animal and it falls into a pit, will you pick it up on the Sabbath, and then he heals this man with dropsy, and basically what dropsy was, it was just kind of like a disease where your, 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 th- your limbs were swollen, uh, it would gush out, things like that. Um, but Jesus, he healed him, and he, then he goes in to tell, he tells a couple parables. He tells the parable of the marriage supper of the lamb, and then he goes into this parable, and he tells him the parable uh, of the great banquet. Um, and there was a big crowd that had gathered a- around uh, Jesus as well. It says in verse 25 that a large crowd had gathered to hear what he was saying. Um, and it got kind of awkward. Jesus got really awkward with these Pharisees because they were rich, they were elite, they were trying to catch him on his words, and uh, basically Jesus, he kind of confronted them, and it got super awkward. And uh, I was thinking this morning when I was kind of going through this, if you've ever had an awkward time at dinner or an awkward time at lunch or you're eating with somebody and it's really awkward, that's how this was. And I remember one time it was my parents, myself, John and Heather, and this other guy, and he was, he was over at dinner eating with us, and he was just... He was just talking. He probably talked 90% of the dinner. And uh, at, when he was mid-sentence telling a dinner or telling a story, he grabs a spoon where the green beans were, 
uh, and just <laughs> he licks it and he puts it back and continues this, continues the story. No one, no one flinches, and we just kind of all look at each other and like, what just happened? That was incredible. And so that that was like the, one of the awkwardest like moments of my life at dinner. But it was really, really pretty funny. But that's what Jesus did. He made this situation extremely awkward, extremely tense for the Pharisees and the crowds that were there. Um, and so the first question leading into this, I want to ask you is, who are you going to invite to dinner? Thanks, Quentin. See you there. Uh, who are you going to invite to dinner? And so that leads us into the, into the next verses. It says, so Jesus begins to tell this parable. He says, he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So Jesus here, he tells us that when you have a dinner or a banquet, or we're in the, obviously the holiday season, it's a Christmas party, he says, you know, don't invite those that you're already friends with. Don't invite those that you're, you're family with. He tells us to invite the people that you would probably think last to invite. Um, you know, if I, if I was having a Christmas party, you know who I would invite? I would obviously invite my family. I would invite my friends. I'd invite our church. And then if I could invite anyone else, you know, just like my bucket list item, I would probably invite Tom Brady because I think he is the greatest athlete of all time. I'd invite Elon Musk because he's an interesting guy. He's created Tesla, and he's just super interesting. Um, I would also would invite uh, a couple of politicians. I was thinking if you invited Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders and Cortez, like, imagine like how interesting of a conversation and a dinner party that would be with all of them there. Um, and it, you know, it would just make it would make for a great conversation. It would be kind of awkward, but it would be great to kind of see them what they were doing there. Um, and that's who I would invite. So who would you invite? You could invite anyone to dinner. Uh, but the way of Jesus is completely different. He tells us when you, when you host people, when you have a party, when you, when you engage with people, don't invite your friends, don't invite your family. He tells us, go out, invite the poor. Go out, invite people that you've never talked to. Go out, invite the neighbor who kind of annoys you. Go out, invite the you know, people uh, at work that kind of annoy you or you don't really talk to. Uh, that's who Jesus tells us to invite. And so... You know, this, this, this passage, when Jesus is talking about this, uh, of who we should invite when we host a, a dinner, uh, obviously, too, Jesus is talking the grand scheme of things. It's not an actual dinner, but he's talking about heaven, the kingdom, the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb as well. And so who, do, who are you inviting to, to this dinner? Um, and when Jesus says this, it reminds me um, of Matthew 25, uh, verses 34 through 36 or 46 says, then the, king of, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you, for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers, you did it for me. So here Jesus is saying, how we treat people, how we treat people at work, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat the poor, how we treat the people in prison, how we treat immigrants, how we can treat refugees, is essentially is how we're treating Jesus Christ. So if you want to measure your love for Jesus, see how you're treating your neighbor. Because that's what, that's, that's what Jesus is, that's a reflection of how much we love Jesus, is how much do we love our neighbor. Um, and so, kind of, kind of with that, I, I was ju I recently just watched a document, docu or actually it's not a documentary, it's a story uh, about a missionary from Australia 
his name's Graham Staines. Uh, if you haven't, it's, you can get it on, you can rent it on YouTube for like a few bucks, but it's, it's called The Least of These. And Graham Staines, he was from Australia, and uh, he moved to India. And basically what he did, he served a leper colony in India. And he was in this state in India called Orisha. And uh, it was basically where he was. It was a very, like, tribal area um, in the middle of nowhere in India. And he devoted his life to just serving the lepers. And he, got, he met, a, he met a, a, another Australian girl there. They got married, and they devoted their life to, to just serving the leper colonies there. And they would bind their wounds. They would, you know, just love on them. And, and through that would share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And, you know, in India, they're a religious, really religious country, uh, and they're a Hindu country. And in Hinduism, if you, believe, if, if you have, like, uh, a disease or if you're disabled or something along those lines, basically you're outcasted. People kick you out of their families. They kick you out of their villages because they believe in reincarnation. So they believe you're reincarnated and you, you have leprosy or you have a disease because some, you did something wrong in your past life. And so if you had leprosy in India, you would be outcasted and you would be allowed – you wouldn't be allowed in the Hindu temples. You wouldn't be allowed to any, any family. You would just be an outcast. And so these two, they gave their lives to serve um, to serve the poor there in India. And it's a famous story because it, tragically it ended him. Uh, he was, you know, basically this one village was getting mad at him because he was proselytizing and trying to convert people from Hinduism to Christianity. Uh, and he ended, up, he ended up becoming a martyr because of it. Um, but he devoted his life to people, to the blind, to the poor, to the people who are leprosy, what Jesus calls us to do. And that's what Graham Staines did, and that's what Jesus calls us to do as well. And so I just want to, uh, you know, with this question, you know, I believe it's time for our church and, and, our, and ourselves as well is to invite people to the banquet, to invite people to the dinner. And so with that question, take this before the Lord and just ask him, Lord, who can I establish a relationship with? You know, is it inviting someone as I go, you know, at, at the grocery store, or out, you know, who's checking out my groceries? Do I need to just tell them that Jesus loves them or ask them if there's anyone that I can pray for? Or is there a neighbor who is, you know, I've established a relationship or I can be intentional with and establish a relationship with and, you know, eventually just love on them and share the gospel with them? Is it someone at work? You know, uh, work is the greatest mission field. You're there 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and the Lord sovereignly puts people in your place in your environment, in your work. He does it sovereignly. There's people that he has placed at your work and that you could easily just say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to invest in them. I'm going to be intentional about uh, building this relationship with them at work, and I'm going to invite them to the wedding. I'm going to invite them to the banquet. And so that's the first point. Ask the question, who are you going to invite? And, and then just take it before the Lord and see who will, he'll, he, I guarantee you, if you take it before the Lord, he will put people on your heart. He will put communities on your heart. He will put poor people in your heart. I don't, I don't know, but just take it before the Lord and say, Lord, who, who are you putting on my heart to invite? Um, so that leads us to the second question, and that's who are you in this parable? Who are you in this parable? Um, and it, it, starting back in the verses, it says, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, one, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said to him, I have bought five yoke of oxen, I and I go examine them, please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. <coughs> Excuse me. So here in this parable, you know, we have a, we have a few people. Um, we have a servant, and we have people who are making excuses. Um, but kind of go back to verse 15, someone says, kind of, kind of with this verse, he says, blessed is everyone who eat bread in the kingdom of God. So, so Jesus is at this feast and someone, ex, you know, just yells this, makes this explanation and it leads Jesus into the parable uh, of the great dinner. But the Jewish people believed that, that when their Messiah came, that they would have a continual feast of, of bread and wine 
in, in the kingdom in, in eternity. Um, but what's sad is that these Jewish people who believe that, they miss the point. Their, their Messiah was right there with them in reality, eating bread with them, drinking with them. But they had missed the point. And so, um, you know, the Pharisees, they were, they were in danger of missing what was right before them. Um, and in the context of these verses as well, um, just like the, you know, just from the, the original uh, text, it's, you know, basically those are the people who made excuses were originally just the Jewish people. Because you look out through the Old Testament, you know, they, God was always sending them messengers, always sending them prophets, saying, hey, this is, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. But they would always reject the prophets. And then Jesus came on the scene, and they rejected Jesus when he was right before them. And so in the context of the, of the scripture, um, it was talking about you know, the people who rejected him were the, were the Jewish people. Um, but also, as well, the story is happening today. Like this story, this parable is still relevant today. You know? And we're all one of these characters in this story. We're either the servant or the messenger of the Lord who is inviting people, who is going out, telling people that there's a wedding that's coming, there's a banquet that's coming, come to the wedding, come to the banquet. Or we're people who are making excuses um, making excuses, what, 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 you know, fill in the blank, that could be a billion things. So ask yourself, who are you in this parable? Um, you know, it says others, the first one said, I bought a field, I go out to see it. I, uh, I've bought five oxen, I go to examine them. I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. And so these are all, no, nothing in here is a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to buy a field. It's not a bad thing to have oxen. It's not a bad thing to get married. What they made, they made excuses because they didn't want but they didn't want what the servant had offered. And, you know, it's kind of convicting because, like, me, I'm single. I'm ready to get married. Um, but, like, at the, at the same time, like, I'm going for the Lord. I want to go for the Lord with everything that I have. I want to live my life for him and for his mission. And if I met a beautiful girl who, you know, didn't want that, then I would be having an excuse. Um, I, I, I would be one person who would have an excuse. You know what I mean? And so, uh, and then also, as well, like, what are some things that, could hinder you uh, from responding to the servant or being that servant. You know, the cares of this world could be one of them. You know, there's so, there's so many things living in America that can distract us from this story that's going on. You know, we've been talking about this etern- the eternal purpose, and that's a reality. This is going on. We've been born into this eternal purpose somehow, some way we've been born into it. And this is going on. This is reality. But there's so many cares that can distract us, especially... Being an American, it, there's so many things, whether it's social media, whether it's TV, whether it's family, whether it's Georgia football, I don't know. There's, so, there's just so many things that can distract us. And as well, being an American, like we're so, we're so busy. And I know every single, one in, every single person in here is busy. Some people are busier uh, than others, obviously. Um, but everyone, being an American, is just so busy. And, you know, just busyness, you know, when if someone's saying, hey, Jesus is saying, come to the wedding, come to the banquet, or go out and share the gospel, go out and invite people to the banquet, are you one who's excusing that and saying, no, I'm just so busy, you know, I'm, I'm so busy with work, I'm so busy with my kids, I'm so busy with uh, my hobbies, going fishing or golfing, um, you know, what, are you making an excuse that you are busy? Um, maybe it's sin, maybe it's lust, maybe it's gluttony, maybe it's you're addicted to media where that's all your time is there and you don't ever pay attention to the invitation that has been given to you or you're not being the servant and going out and spreading the gospel throughout the whole world. Um, or maybe it's a religious spirit where, you know, you're trying to earn something that's already yours in Jesus Christ. You know, I, this is kind of a side note, but every single religion in the world other than Christianity is people trying to work their way to God. You think about the Tower of Babel, it's basically, speaking of India, India has had the effects of Babel more than any nation, I'd say, because Babel, what they did is they, they made sticks and, and bricks, and they tried to work their way to God, and it eventually just crumbled. And that's what India has, they have, had, they have over 100 million gods that they serve, um, that they're, they're trying to work to, that they're trying to work to. Buddhism, same thing, they're trying to become enlightened enough to you know, be in nirvana. Uh, Islam, they're trying to you know, do good work, so when they stand before Allah, that he'll say, okay, you can come in, or you know, your, your, work, your bad works outweighed your good, so you gotta go to hell. You know, Christianity is the only religion where Jesus came in, 
and saved you and did everything for you and that you can rest in his finished work. Every other religion is, is, is working your way to God. So maybe, maybe you're, you have a religious spirit where you're trying to earn something that's already been yours. You've already, you're, you have a hard time receiving the free gift of salvation or the free gift that God is, is pleased with you through Christ Jesus. And so maybe it's that. Maybe there's shame, condemnation from the past. I don't know that's hindering you from, from your walk with God. But ask yourself, who are you? Are you someone who is going out as a messenger, inviting people to the wedding, inviting people to the, to the banquet? Or are you someone who is just excuse after excuse after excuse that there's invitations that are going out, going out, going out, going out, but you're just saying, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, or I have so many cares, I can't pay attention. Uh, so ask yourself, are you being a servant? And a messenger, or are you making excuses? Uh, next, this one guy I met in India, his name is Solomon, and uh, to me, he is an incredible example of someone who is a messenger who's going out uh, to share the gospel, to invite people to the banquet. Uh, you know, Solomon, uh, when, I, when I was there, I was talking to him. My parents knew him, and he's a great guy, but he was just telling me, like, his life vision was to go to every unreached village that he could in India uh, to share the gospel and invite people to the banquet. So basically, unreached is, is villages that literally have never heard the name of Jesus, that have no gospel presence whatsoever. And he's his thing, I want to go to these villages and tell them about Jesus and invite them to the banquet. And he told us that, um, you know, he, he calculated, he has, he's driven the same car since he's done, been in ministry doing this, and he's calculated on his car that he's driven over 700, or I don't know if it's the same car, but he's calculated it. He's driven over 700,000 kilometers going to these villages, sharing the gospel, inviting people to banquet. And uh, I, my math could be wrong here, but 7, 700,000 kilometers would be literally 20 trips around the earth. Uh, and he's been doing that, just going out, inviting people to, to, the, to the wedding, to the banquet. Um, and so I just want to challenge you, you know, who are you in this parable? Again, are you, are you a messenger or are you someone who's, who's too busy making excuses? Um, and uh, the next verse kind of leads us into our next verse. It says, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house got angry and said to his servant, go quickly to the streets and to the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And so this verse here tells us that the the master, who is obviously the father, he was angry when people were rejecting his invitation. He was angry when the Jews rejected his invitation. He gets angry when people today re- reject his invitation. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the streets and the lanes they represent uh, our local community here in the states. Um, and Jesus is telling us here: go out into your community. And invite people. Go out into your workplace and invite people. Um, and I love I, and, and you invite people who are you know that you wouldn't think of inviting as well. Whether that's poor, that's the poor, or whether that's uh, you know immigrants, refugees, whoever that is, go out and invite them in, in the community. Uh, and there's a guy named Bob Goff. Uh, he's a very interesting guy, but he has a, he has a quote that I really thought was good. He said, "I realized I was inv- avoiding the people." I didn't understand, and the ones who live differently than me. Here's why. Some people creep me out. Sure, I was polite to them, but sadly, this last, this last part, he says, I've been, I spent my whole life avoiding the people Jesus spent his whole life engaging. And so that's so easy for us to do. It's for people who are not our friends or not that we can't interact with easily. You know, we avoid them. We avoid our neighbors who annoy us. We, avo- we annoy people at work who annoy us. We're, if we can't engage with people, we just, you know, we avoid them. But, that, you know, those are the people who Jesus would intentionally engage uh, and try to share the gospel with them, try to invite them to the wedding, to the banquet. And he tells us, Bob tells us one story uh, about when he was in Uganda. He's like the American can- chancellor or something in Uganda. He's a really interesting guy, but he started a, a school for witch doctors in Gulu, Uganda, uh, and he was saying these are the creepiest, most, you know, people that you wouldn't want to mess with that are just out there that everyone, everyone kind of just pushes to the side because they, they have power. He was saying that, you know, there's people who will, you know, they'll, they'll put a curse on you and then that day they'll die. Um, just like the power that these witch doctors have. So everyone would avoid them. And, and they would also, the witch doctors too, he was saying, would also do like human trafficking. So they would sacrifice children 
and they were just a big problem in the community. And so everyone was trying to avoid them, but Bob, he engaged them, and he started a school for these witch doctors where it would teach them to read and write because they were mainly, they were pretty illiterate. And so he started a school for them, and basically he gave them two books. One was the Bible, and the other was his book called Love Does. And he started this school for witch doctors, and he taught them to read and to write. And he was saying, like, so many of them were coming to Christ through this school because they were learning to read, they were learning to write, they were reading the Bible, and they were coming to, to Christ. So who are those people in your life that you can engage that who, you know, you might, not want it to, you might not want to talk to, you might not want to engage, but the Lord is putting on your heart to engage them. And then the next verse, it says, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and to the hedges and compel the people to come in, that my house may be, f- my house may be filled. For I tell you, None of those who were invited shall taste of my banquet. So here I believe Jesus is speaking prophetically uh, that, that, that the Jew or the Gentiles will be included into the one new race. Uh, he's saying, you know, he's speaking prophetically of the Great Commission of going out into the nations and telling people that there's a dinner, that there's a banquet, get ready, come, come, to, the, come to the banquet, come to the wedding. Um, and this verse here, I... I really got a great picture of what this looked like. This earlier this year, I went to India, and um, are the pictures up there? I, don't, I guess which one it is. Okay, so this this picture here. Uh, so this we took like a. So this is. So I went to Hyderabad, and this city here, we took like a three-hour train ride from Hyderabad, and we from Hyder from from the tr- three-hour train ride or go back to that other picture. Yeah. So. We took like an, from so we did like a three-hour train ride and then like an hour or two drive to this to this village, which was literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and if you look around, you if you looked around, it was just basically cornfields everywhere. And these people were just basically farmers who lived a very simple life. Uh, and they met under a tree, so they had church under a tree. And it was mainly just women who were were there. And you know they didn't they didn't they couldn't read or write. They were illiterate people. Um, and so they didn't have a Bible. They don't have a Bible in their own language, obviously. They don't have an audio Bible in their language. But they have a pastor who basically he reads the Bible in Telugu, and then he translates it to them about what it's saying. And, but they're, they're encountering the love of Jesus Christ. They're encountering Jesus for who he is. And it was just kind of like, one, it was just like, this is what that verse looks like. Jesus says, go out to the highways and to the byways. Go out. And this is what it lo- looked like. And it was kind of also humbling because, like, I mean, the gospel is incredibly simple. You know, Jesus is fully God, fully man. He died for our sins. And it's like, yes, you disciple them. Yes, you, 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 you teach them the way of Christ. But at the same time, like, they can't read or write. They don't have a Bible in their own language. And, like, but they're encountering Jesus. And they're encountering him. And, uh, and then the, kind of the same trip, I, think, I don't know if it was the same day or not, kind of the next church that we went to. Um, uh, go to the next picture. So this is like another, this is another church pretty close to this other village. Um, but basically, like, all the people there were farmers. So they wake up early in the morning, uh, and they go out and farm. They take most of the afternoon off because it's really hot in India. And then that night, they go back and farm. Um, and, uh, yeah, this was like one of the only churches in this village. And it was basically uh, just a tarp with a little tin roof. Um, and it was just like incredibly humbling. We, we dedicated this church building, me and two other guys were there, and we dedicated this church building to the Lord, and this pastor who was just incredibly humble just started weeping, just started just bawling, and just was so thankful that the Lord had provided this place for them to meet because it gives them more credibility in the village. People would make fun of them because they didn't have a place to meet, and you know this, they gave up a place to meet. But during that time when we were dedicating it, uh, I, I just shared like a five-minute thing, and then we just started praying for them, and the Holy Spirit just like really broke out. Uh, people were weeping, people were crying, and uh, people were getting delivered. And there's this one guy here, uh, or that's a picture inside of the church. But this guy here, uh, my friend Nate uh, was praying for him. He fell over under the power of the Spirit, and my, and my friend Nate was just saying, Lord, I pray he would have an encounter with Jesus. I pray that you would open his eyes to see Jesus. And this guy didn't speak any English. And after we were done, this guy goes up to our interpreter, whose name was Aruna. And he's like, hey, when I was laying down on the ground, this man who was dressed in white was hovering over me. 
And so my friend prayed that he would see Jesus. And this guy who had no idea what he was praying, didn't speak a lick of English, said, hey, there's this guy dressed in white, a robe, standing over me. And so this guy had a vision of Jesus in this meeting. And so, the, so that, so it's just kind of with those stories, like the Lord has shown me what it looks like to go out into the middle of nowhere in these countries in, in India and in Africa, where literally there's, there's, no, there's no place to, to really, they have no access to the gospel. I know the Lord has revealed it. I know that's a lot of mystery, like God has, his gospel has went out throughout all creation. I, I get that. And there's a mystery on how that, all that works. But Jesus tells us to go to the highways, go to the byways, and invite people to the wedding, invite them to the banquet. And it's just, I just, too, back to the story, I know I'm kind of rambling with this, but it's just so much simpler than we make it out to be sometimes. The Christian life, it's, it's simple. It's just like, love Jesus with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let Jesus love you. If you do that, like, you have it all figured out. I, obviously, there's... I love theology, I love studying, I love discipleship. I'm not saying, I'm not minimizing those things, but it's a lot simpler than we make it out to be sometimes. Um, so just the application with these verses is, who are you going to invite? And I just, you know, I, I think, I just encourage us all, myself included, like, who is it in the community uh, that we can invite, that we can minister to? Who is it in among the nations that we can go out and share the gospel with. You know, the Lord might call you to another nation. You know, I know we have a small church, and it's like, yeah, the Lord would probably never call me to go somewhere else, but you never know that. Like, ask him, is, are, you calling, you know, are you calling me to go somewhere? His, his command in Matthew 28 is, is pretty clear. Go out and make disciples of all nations. So the Lord may be calling you to a community. He might be calling you to a people group. He might be calling you to a nation. I have no idea, but don't limit what the Lord is going to say because it could be what you think. could be completely something completely different. But ask him, Lord, who can I invite to this, to this uh, banquet? Uh, two more questions. Um, so third question is, are you going to choose comfort or are you going to choose the cross? And the next verse is Jesus says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned to them and he said, If anyone does, comes to me and does not hate his own father, or his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, and his sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So Jesus, had, in the context of this verse, he had a whole crowd around him. And Jesus was saying, you can't follow me. You, can't, you have no part of me unless you take up your cross and follow me. Which is pretty, you know, I think now we think of a cross as like a decoration or something we wear around our neck. And obviously it is. But this is literally Jesus telling people in today's context, you know, go to the electric chair and come and follow me. Basically, completely die to yourself. Die to any dream that you have. Die to any hope that you have. Die to any plan that you have. Um, and he's telling us that our close, and, and Jesus doesn't, obviously with this verse, does not mean the hate your father or hate your mother or hate your friends. He's saying your closest earthly relationship should look like hate compared to your love and your devotion towards me. So ask yourself that question as well. Like, does my closest earthly relationship look like hate compared to my love and my devotion to, to Jesus? And obviously, that's an impossible thing probably. You know, and let, it's, a, it's a work of grace. And so if, you, if you're honest with yourself, it's like, no, I, I love so many other things other than Jesus, then tell him, be honest with him, and he'll transform your heart. Um, this is a side note too, like a famous uh, mystic back in the day, St. Teresa of Avila, like one of her prayers before like she went into like this deep communion of love with Jesus is that she said, Lord, I don't love you. I don't love you. Make me love you. And if that's what you feel today, if your love and devotion for Jesus is not greater than your wife or not greater than your husband or not greater than your son or your best friend, then ask him, tell him, Lord, my love is is not where, I love my wife more than you. I love my daughter more than you. I love this more than you. Tell him, be honest with him, and tell him, I want to love you more. And he'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. It's a, it's a work of grace. Um, but yeah, and then also, like, in just embracing the cross. Like, you know, if you don't take up your cross and follow Christ, you have no crown. You have no crown at all. Uh, it's impossible to, I, I, in my opinion, to enter the kingdom of heaven without taking up the cross. It's really not my opinion. It's Jesus' opinion. It's pretty clear. So ask yourself, are you going to embrace a comfortable life or are you going to embrace the cross? 
you know, we all have decisions to make. Like, it's so hard. Like, it literally is so hard in America. Like, again, I, I keep going back to that, but there's so many things that distract us. There's so many comforts in America, which I'm thankful for. I, like, I love America. But, like, at the same time, it's, it's hard to deny. It's hard to go out and share the gospel. It's hard to literally deny yourself and, and go to the nations. And Jesus, his call, again, he says uh, in Luke 10, he says, The harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, earn, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then he, then he says, Behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. So Jesus is literally saying, Hey, if you're following me, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And then I'm just going to skip that next verse. Um, but yeah, so like, will you embrace the comfort of this life or the comfort of the American dream? Or will you uh, embrace the cross? And Jesus, he's, he, did, he did what he's asking us to do. He left the comfort of heaven. He left the comfort of uh, everything that he had. And he entered into this story that he created uh, as a man. And he, he basically, he, Jesus is the greatest missionary ever. He's the first missionary. And he is inviting us to do what he did. And uh, last question. Um, are you going to settle for a, for maintenance, or are you going to sacrifice for mission? And then skipping down to verse 33, Jesus says, Therefore, if you do not renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. So again, Jesus is, is telling us if we follow him, uh, if we follow him, we have to renounce everything and follow him. And uh, I, I've kind of just been, uh, this past month or few weeks I don't really know I've been in Luke um, I've been in the book of Luke just kind of reading it and uh, it's so convicting like reading these verses like they're so convicting if you if you know just what Jesus is saying and then and then Luke 12 I was reading this and I was just like man this is incredibly convicting like does not every American do this isn't this not the American dream Jesus says in Luke, Luke 12, verse 15, he says, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a story, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, What shall I do with all my crops? And he said, I will do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. There I will store my grain and my goods, and my soul will say, I have ample goods for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this, soul, this night your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up for himself treasure, or th- so is the one who lays for himself uh, treasures and is not rich toward God. And just reading that uh, just over and over this, the past few weeks is like, man, every American does this. You know, like I think everyone probably here is guilty of it to some extent. Is And I get it, like there's good financial principles that you live by, like, I'm not bashing those at all. Obviously, there's wisdom, but every American, I can think of friends who, okay, I'm making more money. I'm going to get a bigger and better car. I'm going to buy a bigger and better house. Like, I'm not saying it, but Jesus is saying, like, that's your, you're basically, you're, you're living for this life only. Not that you can never have a nice house or a nice car. By any means, I'm not saying that. Jesus is not saying that. But I think he, what he is saying is, like, especially in America, like, we have so much abundance of finances, and I know I'm kind of saying this first a little bit longer than I thought, but ask yourself, like, as well, like, with, ma- with are you going to choose maintenance? Just try to easily just live. The, it's so easy to live in America, in, in a sense, like, with, with finances and comfort. But are you, or are you going to sacrifice for his mission, for the people in Africa, for the people in India, for the people that you minister to in jail, uh, for people in our community who need, who need, uh, who could use finances? Like, I, I don't know. I'm rambling. I know, but ask yourself, like, just read these verses and just literally say, is, it, am I, is this me? Is there any part of this that's in me? And I think if, if, if American read these verses, and I think every American, not every American, but a lot of them would say, there's some of this in me. Like, yes, I, I'm, I, if I make more money, then yeah, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. But what would Jesus say? You know, if you're making, if you're making more money, are you going to be a steward to fund the nations? So ask yourself that question. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of, just to summarize, like, I think the, the call that Christ has given us 
it's pretty clear in these verses. You know, it's a call to sell your possessions, to love your neighbor, to serve the poor, and to go to the nations. Um, you know, I think just the harvest is ripe. I think the harvest is ripe in America. I think there's people, like, again, that God has providentially put in your life at work or in the grocery store or whoever, that the Lord is saying, invite them to the banquet. Invite them to the wedding. There's, people, there's nations as well. We have access to Africa and India right now. There's nations that need to hear the gospel. There's nations that need to hear that there's a bridegroom who loves them, who's waiting for them. Um, and I'll end with this story. Um, so a couple years ago, I don't know if the picture's up there, uh, the last picture. Uh, two years ago from the day, I was in, I was in Nepal, and I was, tr- I was hiking with my friend in the Himalayas, and it was incredible. But you can see, like, in the background there, there's, like, little villages, there's little houses uh, that these people live in the middle of nowhere in uh, Nepal and the Himalayas. And in these mountains, like, they, f- they have, like, a form of, like, um, they're either the Buddhists or they're, they're, uh, some are Hindu, some are Tibetan uh, Buddhists. But uh, these people, uh, basically, they have no access to the gospel whatsoever unless people trek and go in and share the gospel, share who Jesus is with them. But my friend Robert, he's, he's, or was a missionary there. His brother-in-law is a missionary there. And uh, not too long ago, they just put out a documentary. But they went to these one mountain ranges, one mountain range in Nepal, him and a couple other guys. And basically what they were doing, they were going, literally villages who literally have had, most likely have never heard the name of Jesus before. And it was, a, it was right along the Tibetan border uh, of, of Nepal. And they were going in, and they met this one guy who, in his house, he had like the doll, pictures of the Dalai Lama all in his house. He's a Buddhist, and they told him about Jesus, and they gave him this gospel track. And he had never heard the name of Jesus before. He didn't know who he was, um, and then so then they told him about him. They gave this gospel track. They prayed for him, uh, and then that night he had a dream of Jesus. Jesus appeared to him in a dream and told him that I'm the truth. And uh, you know the Lord is working all around the earth right now. Um, and, too, I think, too, like, I don't know if this is a word, but, like, even if you've been, I don't know, maybe you've been bored in, in, in a sense of your relationship with God. Like, maybe, I don't know, like, I, God's never boring, obviously, but obviously your hearts can get dull and you can get bored. But, you know, I think Christianity, is, it's meant to be an adventure. One is in your relationship with Jesus. Like, there's meant to be an adventure in that relationship. But then also, to going out, uh, into the highways, into the byways, going out into the community. It's meant to be an adventure. Uh, you know, like, you think of the cross, like, it's, it's, it's vertical. So that's our relationship with Christ when we embrace the cross. But it's also horizontal where we embrace the cross for others as well. And so I think, you know, if you ask yourself, are, am I bo- have I been bored with Christianity? Have I been bored, you know, with, Christi- with, you know, with, my re- you know, with this religion or this, this relationship? Am I bored at all? And if you are, like, maybe there's not enough adventure and not enough life of faith in your walk right now. So ask the Lord, like, ask yourself, have I been bored? Maybe if you've been bored, then maybe go out and go somewhere and share the gospel. Or maybe sacrifice a little bit more money for his kingdom. Uh, Everyone, you know, the Lord's probably going to tell us all a little bit differently. But ask those four questions. Um, Ask those four questions and just see what the Lord says, you know, because, like, just like, and, and then, too, like, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. I'm sorry, but uh, if you don't read the Bible, like, just read, like, a chapter a day in the Gospels or two chapters a day or whatever you have the capacity for. Because when you do that, it's like, man, I haven't, read, I haven't read Luke, you know, 15 in a while. Or I haven't read Luke 12 where he's talking about this guy who would store up crops. I haven't read that in, I don't know, it's been a long time. It's like, man, that's super convicting. Or, man, if you don't, if you don't hate yourself or you hate your friends more than you love me, then, like, you can't be my disciple. That's so convicting, and I think we just don't, you know, but when you see it from Jesus, his words, like, this is so real. Like, he, he is saying this loud and clear of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Um, and, like, too, like, there's so much more joy and happiness when you, like, just, like, go out and do it. Like, have you ever just been led of the Spirit and just share the gospel with somebody or just say, hey, I, the Lord Jesus loves you? Have you ever, like, that's exciting, you know? Like, it's, it takes some faith, but, like, it's exciting as well. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm trying to think if I want to do that or not, but 
Um, hmm. What do you guys want to do? Are you guys ready to go? <laughs> no, it's not really going for me. I don't know. Um, no, I guess, like, so just, like, reading, like, uh, just kind of been in Luke the past few weeks, and, yeah, like, you know, it kind of comes and goes, and I'll end with this, it kind of comes and goes, like, in waves of just, like, past few weeks have just been feeling, like, so, like, it's just so intoxicated with God and his love for me, and uh, even just, like, feeling at times, like, I couldn't, like, I was working, and I literally just said, hey, Lord, just stop, because I can't work. It was that intense, um, and uh, which I know that sounds crazy. You're feeling God's love, feeling his affections for you to say kind of stop, but it was literally the point where, like, if you don't stop, I can't focus. I can't get things done. I can't do what I'm doing, um, and it was like that for, like, a few weeks, um, and so I just want to close and pray and just pray that, you know, God would just baptize you afresh in his love because what he's called us to do, it's, it's impossible apart from his love. It's, apart, it's impossible apart from his grace, um, you know, and, and um, you know, it's, I, it's like a picture as well, like, um, of like a water wheel. You know, I, I, when I think of the, you know, we've, if you've been born again, you've been united to the Trinity, you know, forever, once and forever. You're, you're, you're united with him, and, and in the Trinity is love. So that's what God is. God is love, and if you look at the Trinity, that is love, and if you've been born again, you've been united to that. But I picture that as like a water wheel. You know, we're like a water wheel. And it's const- the way the water wheel works is they're constantly being full and constantly being poured out. And so um, I just want to pray for myself and for you that God would just baptize us afresh in his love uh, and his happiness as well. Like, I think God is happy. Uh, obviously, he burns with indign- indignation every day, but he's happy as well. Um, so if you just stand, I'll close this in prayer. And I uh, just want to pray that the Lord will just baptize us. Just baptize us in his love. And if you feel like you don't have much love or affection for Jesus now, just, just tell him, be honest. Um, if you feel like you've been bored in your relationship with God and you, and you want to go on an adventure, just tell him, I want to go on an adventure. And so, Lord... Hey, Lord, you, uh, you <clears throat> Lord, when we ask you for bread, you don't give us a stone. When we ask you for fish, you don't give us a serpent, Lord. You, you give us what we ask for, Lord. And Lord, so we just pray, Lord, for an increased measure of your spirit in our hearts, Lord. Lord, that you would sovereignly and providentially right now in this moment, as well as people who go to this church who are not here today, Lord, would you baptize us? in your love, a fresh baptism of love. Lord, you've brought us to your banqueting table, and your banner over us is love. Your table, your dinner is one of, of deep love, of deep ecstasy, of deep happiness, of deep joy. Lord, I pray that you would baptize us in the affections of the Trinity, that our hearts would feel the happiness and the joy of Jesus Christ. Lord, baptize us in love. Baptize us, Lord. Lord, give us grace to love you with everything that we have. Give us grace to just to love you, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Give us grace to embrace the cross and to deny ourselves and to tell others about Jesus. Lord, put people on our hearts, put people on our paths, even today, Lord, that Lord, that you would put people on our path and, and um, that we can minister to. Dad, do you have anything? No. Drew, you got anything? <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, does anybody have anything? Yeah, I feel like we're supposed to wait. I, I'm kind of feeling like I want to go and eat and take a nap, but I know it's past 12. I know when you're, in this, when you're sitting down, you're kind of ready to go, but I don't know. I just feel like we're supposed to wait for a second.
kind of along the same lines that Stephen prayed, but also uh, uh, spoke. Let's just pray for a fresh stirring of evangelism, a fresh stirring of uh, the uh, anointing and outreach. Because I really, I, I was sensing he was sharing some of what he was going to share with me earlier in the week, and I really was sensing that this message is not just a message, it's not just a teaching, but it's a, it's a real timely word, uh, almost like a prophetic call to us as a fellowship. I really do sense that. And uh, so let's pray that uh, the Lord would stir for all of us fresh in that. You know, it's, it's so, uh, you know, it's so easy as a forerunner ministry to focus on things in our own life and in just things other than reaching out to our next door neighbors and the other, uh, other people around us as well as the nations. So, Father, I just agree with me now. Father, we pray for a fresh stirring of evangelism uh, out of this house in each and every one of us, O oh God. We ask for that. We pray that you would just do a, a powerful work in us. Lord, I just make a declaration right now that this is the time, now is the time, this is the place that uh, there shall be a... a uh, a reaching out into this community with the with a, an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which would include a discipleship, but it would also cl include evangelism. So we ask, Father, that you would stir each and every one of us in that. Oh God, we pray in every way in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah.